welcome to the session. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited um, to see all of you. Um, All right, uh, my name is Claire Baumkamp. Um, I'm going to be helping to moderate this session along with my colleague, Elliot Schwartz. Um, and so we're going to be giving a very quick overview. Um, there's a lot more to say than we have time for in this session um, on the latest advances in cultivated meat science and technology. So we have uh, seven really amazing speakers for you today. We're going to start with um, some folks who are uh, pushing the boundaries of cultivated meat within academia. Um, we'll have a Q&A session for those first three speakers following that, so please do submit your questions via swap card, um, either during the, during the talks or during the Q&A sessions, and we'll, um, we'll get to as many questions as we're able to. Uh, following that, we'll have two speakers who um, we think are really great examples of uh, folks from industry who are um, kind of part of this collaborative research ecosystem. Um, and then another Q&A session um, followed by a couple of folks who kind of straddle those two um, areas um, and, and have really done a, an excellent job of taking their academic research and translating it into industry. So this is going to be a very, very quick um, overview for those who aren't as familiar with the science. Um, but when we're talking about cultivating meat, very generally what we're talking about is taking a small sample of cells from an animal, whether that's a fish, a cow, a chicken, um, going into this phase of cell proliferation where we're taking a few cells and putting them under appropriate conditions for them to divide into many, many cells. And then we take those many, many cells and give them the appropriate cues for them to become uh, something like fat or muscle depending on the type of product that we're trying to make. Um, and so in the end we have a product that um, ideally re resembles uh, animal muscle tissue in terms of the cell types, the organization, et cetera. And so one thing that we're seeing as uh, people are, cha are tackling this really challenging question of how do we cultivate meat at scale is the emergence of a vibrant and collaborative research ecosystem. Um, and so this graph is just showing the number of pu publications about cultivated meat per year. Uh, this 2023 bar is already out of date, which we're very excited about. So every publication in this graph is really a tiny, tiny piece of the puzzle of how do we cultivate meat. Um, and the folks you're going to hear from today are the people making that happen. Um, and this is not just academics publishing research, but it's also companies like Believer and Moza who are um, finding ways to kind of be part of the conversation um, in, in open access research generally um, and kind of bridging those gaps. So not just being, okay, we're industry, we're doing this, we're academia, we're doing this, but the folks you're gonna hear from today are, are kind of um, thinking on all of those levels, whether they're coming from uh, technically one side or the other. And so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Professor Tetsuya Shimizu from Tokyo Women's Medical University. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm Tatsuya Shimizu from Tokyo Women's Medical University. It's my great pleasure to present our work in this uh, firehouse. So anyway, so, uh, okay. My uh, title is Circular Cell Culture for Cultivated Meat Production. So the current food production depends on the grain cultivation and, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, grain cultivation. Okay. So the <laughs> food production depends on the grain cultivation and livestock breeding, but we have now proposed a new uh, food production system using algae and animal cell culture. So anyway, this slide shows uh, uh, several, uh, several uh, what's happened. This slide shows uh, several uh, our cultivated meat in uh, our research lab. So left panel shows uh, only simple uh, method, solidifying cells in the mold at high density. So the, uh, this is a uh, uh, bovine myoblast, and this comes from the chicken uh, myoblast. 
and uh, we can grill it like this. And uh, on the other hand, the light panel shows uh, our special technology, cell sheet based tissue engineering, engineering, which have been already clinically applied for the resident therapy. So we also apply this technology to cultivated meat. Anyway, we can uh, easily layer cell sheet. So the, uh, this is a ch layered chicken my brush sheet. This is a bovine uh, my brush sheet. So anyway, we can successfully fabricate such a, a three-dimensional tissue uh, if we use uh, normal culture media uh, containing FBS. It's very expensive and not sustainable. So the you know, problem is the culture media. So many researchers and the company have focused on the uh, growth factor, but uh, our focus is uh, nutrients. So that if the uh, cultured meat becomes popular, we need a large amount of nutrients. So nutrients come from the grains. So for cultivating grains, we need a, a large amount of fertilizer and the pesticide, which come from the uh, fossil fuel. It will lead to the uh, environmental load. And another problem is a large amount of uh, media waste. It also causes the uh, environmental load. So to clear these problems, uh, we had the idea uh, using the algae like this. So we replace a grain to the algae like this. If we can uh, culture the uh, animal cells using algae extract, and also if we can culture algae using animal cell culture waste, maybe we can make a, such a sustainable circular cell culture. I'll explain the uh, detail. What happened? Okay, so uh, this slide shows uh, how to extract uh, RG extract nutrients. So in that case, we use uh, uh, six types of RG. Anyway, for extracting, we use the hydrolysis. And after that, we measure the nutrients and also the, we culture the cells using uh, such an RG extract. So this is a result. So we can uh, go to enough glucose and amino acid, of course, there are uh, several uh, variations in the, among the allergies. So on the right panel shows the uh, uh, data, so that we confirmed algae extract can replace nutrient in C to C tube cells. So the uh, red bar indicates the uh, normal uh, media using the MEM, and this is uh, our uh, special culture medium using algae extract, uh, very similar. So we also confirm the RG extract can replace nutrient in bovine myoblast. Next, this slide shows the change in component amount before and after culture. So 78% glucose was consumed and only 22% remained. However, regarding amino acid, above 50% amino acid remained in the uh, animal cell culture media waste. And also the most of the mineral remained in the culture media. However, uh, ammonia and lactate are uh, accumulated in the culture media, so we must change the culture media. So to clear this problem, we culture the algae using the animal cell culture waste. In that case, we use uh, two algae types, uh, freshwater uh, chlorella and uh, seawater chlorococcum. To both algae can proliferate uh, with the animal cell culture waste. So we succeeded in algal culture with animal cell culture waste. So we now combined two of these processes. So the, uh, in that case, we start from here. So regarding growth factor, we have collaborated with a Japanese integral culture company so that we use their technique. So first we culture the cells using uh, some serum uh, after culture the growth factor producing cells. And after that, we culture the myoblast using such a serum, uh, supernatant containing growth factor. And then we uh, culture the algae using uh, uh, myoblast culture waste medium. And uh, after that, we extracted nutrient from these uh, expanded algae. And uh, after combining the microalgae culture waste medium and the nutrients, so we move to the second cycle. So this slide shows the uh, first cycle. So myoblast can proliferate uh, with the uh, supernatant using uh, growth promoting uh, cells. And after that, we culture the algae using animal cell culture waste. Uh, algae can proliferate. And also, we can get enough glucose and amino acid uh, from the uh, algae, expanded algae. 
So next is the second cycle, very similar data. So we can successfully uh, grow the myoblast cells. So in that case, we don't use additional uh, growth factor uh, from the cells. So that uh, we also uh, culture the uh, algae using the animal cell culture waste in second cycle. And we can get enough glucose and amino acid as same as the first cycle. So the, uh, each late uh, animal cell expansion, algal expansion, and ammonia recycle rate is similar, like this. Like this. Very similar. So now we have uh, tried to improve each process of this circular culture system. As regarding algae, uh, we, can, we have now uh, used uh, the gene-modified gene modified algae. So that, and also we now optimizing the uh, extraction method and also the growth factor producing cell uh, combinations. So, so this slide shows the future circular cell culture system in 2030. So this system can grow one kilogram uh, cultured meat per 30 square meter per day. So that if we can develop this machine, so if this system was spread all over the Netherlands, so it could cover the meat production in the world. It's only my estimation. And also we would like to apply to this system to the home kitchen, sushi bar, and also future the uh, food shortage areas. And finally, we would like to uh, apply it, this system, space or moon. Okay, th uh, that's all. Thank you so much, Tatsuya. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Mark Richards from Nanyang Polytechnic. Right, so good morning, everyone. I'm Mark from Nanyang Polytechnic in Singapore, and I'm very grateful um, to GFI for this opportunity to share some of my research at this session. So a couple of quick disclosures. Um, we have a few licensing arrangements with both Umami Bioworks in Singapore and Fisheroo in Singapore. And at this point, I'd like to quickly acknowledge um, my collaborators. We are very close to Umami, Bio uh, Umami Bioworks. They used to be called Umami Meats, but now they are Umami um, Bioworks, and they remain our closest collaborators. Fisheroo, a new Singapore startup in the cultivated seafood space, National University of Singapore, and our very generous funders, um, the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, and of course, uh, the Good Food Institute. So just a couple of uh, quick words about the School of Applied Science, where I'm, I'm from. We have about five diplomas, but the school is uh, traditionally strong in um, the food sciences and in um, food safety, and we have a broad R&D focus in the farm-to-fork domain. But our aim is to support the cultivated meat industry with technical and cost reduction solutions, and our research is very industry-focused. Our R&D in the cultivated meat space has centered um, mainly on the upstream uh, activities, primarily in cell line development and in uh, low-cost uh, plant-based media development. But we're also moving downstream into the uh, scaling solutions and novel food product development domain. So this year, uh, we have plans to set up a cell -like foundry in NYP. It should be up uh, in, by December, and we hope to be able to support uh, the uh, cultivated meat startups in Singapore with their bioprocessor issues. And we also have a novel food product development team in the school, and um, we've worked with a few of uh, few cultivated meat companies in Singapore to help them with their um, food product development. Apart from that, we can also do sensory evaluation uh, and um, help companies prepare their dossiers for risk assessment uh, and uh, also food product labeling. So we strive to engage the 15 or so um, cultivated meat companies in Singapore to provide end-to-end -end solutions and to help them grow and to minimize risk. So this slide shows um, what we have done for uh, fish cell line development. We have derived 11 spontaneously immortalized pea sign cell lines from a variety of bony as well as cartilaginous tropical fish species. Many of these cell lines have undergone uh, several hundred population doublings. Some are muscle progenitors, the others are fibroblasts, and um, the muscle progenitors for some cell lines retain their PAC7 positivity. And, um, while the others are fibroblast lines. So we have characterized these muscle cell lines for differentiation markers via cell surface marker staining, uh, as well as uh, gene expression uh, profiling. 
I think in a recent development, Umami Bioworks have, has uh, managed to show that some of these cell lines have uh, been successfully suspension culture adapted without the use of uh, microcarriers. So our current re I should go back a slide. <laughs> okay. Now our current research focuses mainly right, on efforts to replace key serum proteins with plant extracts. And we're very grateful to the Good Food Institute as well as ASTAR for funding support in this area to develop solutions. And these projects also represent a joint effort with Umami Bioworks. Specifically, we are looking at alternative albumins and transferrins from sources such as legumes, seeds, algae, and plant byproducts from the food manufacturing industry. And we have developed a var variety of protocols based on alkali acid extraction to prepare high priority protein isolates uh, because in our experience, we find that different plant material appear to require slightly different um, extraction approaches. So there doesn't seem to be a universal protocol which works well for you know, legumes and, and seeds, for example. So we've had to tweak this quite a bit. The next slide shows The next slide shows um, MELDI data for one of our extraction protocols, which we use to enrich for the low molecular weight albumin fractions. And the MELDI data shows differences between the protein profiles of the crude extracts uh, on the top panel and uh, the cleaned up extracts with enrichment for low molecular weight um, protein in the lower panel. And cell-based screens uh, with these low molecular weight extracts on fish cells are currently ongoing. Yeah. So, so this slide shows some of the preliminary data that we had demonstrating that whole plant protein extracts can indeed substitute for fetal calf serum over multiple passages with high efficiency. So we have about six um, very promising uh, plant extracts and which support the growth of fish lines in low um, FCS conditions. So I think that panel over there represents 0.5% calf serum and here's the 10% serum control. And what we are doing now is to look at the low molecular weight fractions from these six extracts to see if we can replicate this result with even better uh, outcomes. So um, generally we find that you know, extract concentrations of about less than one milligram per ml to be optimal, but um, uh, with, as with these plant serums, we do find a slight increase in the doubling time of about 20 to 30%. Cell attachment is sometimes an issue, but we prefer not to use ECMs um, like laminate and so on. So um, we have also conducted spend media analysis with LTMS on our fish cell lines, and this is data for GEM1 and Unagi cell line. Um, so spend in media analysis will obviously help us with media optimization studies and cost reduction while providing you know, insight into cell metabolism and biochemical pathway utilization. What we find is that overall there appear to be numerous media components which remain unutilized by the cells. Um, in this analysis, we, the, the LCMS provides us with information on, on about 160 compounds, and we find that more than 80% of these uh, compounds are typically do not trend down in our experiments. This is a comparison between this is a comparison between spend media analysis from GEM1 and CHO cell lines, and clearly we find that the different cell lines appear to have different media requirements. Particularly, this is also apparent between cell lines of different P science fish species, albeit with a slight, with slightly, uh, albeit to a slightly lower extent. So, therefore, um, media optimization will definitely be necessary for cultivated meat cell lines, which have been selected for products, production scale expansion, as there's slightly no one size fits all. This last slide of mine um, is on a self-assembling hydrogel scaffold that's made out of dipeptides. These hydrogels are quite different from your typical polymeric hydrogel, which have, has covalent bonds. And the motivation here was to create a scaffold which could be easily removed from the cell mass. So we synthesized a, a series of synthetic dipeptides which could, can self-assemble and disassemble. And in this case, um, the, the dipeptides will assemble in the 
in, in the condition where there is uh, low water content and disassemble uh, when uh, the water content is increased. So what we have here now is a hydrogel where you can easily uh, remove it from the cell mass that's grown on it. So cell attachment on these hydrogels has been satisfactory, but we are trying quite hard to find a natural alternative uh, to these dipeptides, naturally occurring alternative, and also we're trying hard to improve uh, cell attachment by modifying uh, the dipeptide structure. So thank you, uh, that's all I have, and I, had, I hope you found my sharing interesting. Thank you, Mark. Um, just a quick reminder to everyone, uh, if you have questions, feel free to submit them uh, via the swap card app. Our next speaker is going to be Stephanie Kvetsky from UCLA. Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie. I am a fifth year PhD bioengineering student at UCLA, and today I'm excited to talk about some research updates from the Rowett Lab. So in the Rowett Lab, we like to think about cells as materials. So to do that, we build new technologies that can study the mechanical properties of cells in a high throughput manner. We then use that to define and understand mechanisms of how cells regulate mechanical behaviors. And then we can translate that knowledge from different applications, such as developing more effective cancer treatments and also developing efficient and scalable processes for tissue culture, for culture meat applications. And this work really started in 2018 when we were awarded GFI's inaugural research grant and I was awarded a New Harvest Fellowship. And it was really these foundational funding opportunities that allowed us to accelerate our research in this space. And since then, we've been able to secure federal funding uh, from agencies like the USDA, the State of California, and the National Science Foundation. So we're just very grateful for these opportunities. Since then, we've been focusing on developing delicious cultured meat. We're doing that by customizing the physical properties of scaffolds, whether that's building novel scaffolds or identifying the ideal mechanical environment that the cells prefer to grow on. We're also identifying food grade small molecules that can be used to accelerate muscle and tissue growth. And finally, we're developing methodology to build 3D tissues. And all of this work is done with the help of collaborators that we've been able to uh, build out on campus as well as across different universities. So today I'm gonna talk about my work, um, which is uh, recently published to develop multi-component tissue towards building marbled cultured meat. So as we know, this can be a very complicated process. So different cells prefer different mechanical, topographical, and media environments. So my approach was to customize scaffolds for each cell type. So for muscle cells, I'm electrospinning aligned nanofibers since the alignment of scaffolds have been shown to drive muscle cell differentiation into multinucleated myotubes. I then fabricate softer microcarriers for my fat cells, since studies have shown that softer substrates can actually increase lipid accumulation in adipocytes. I can then grow each cell on their respective scaffolds in their preferred media, and then stack them post-differentiation to build multi-component tissue, or this kind of looks like a lasagna, but <laughs> um, we're gonna call this marbled cultured meat. And the cool thing about this is that we're seeing that these tissues are actually spontaneously adhering to one another um, without the use of additional crosslinkers. But I wanted to test the time scale of this phenomenon. So I tested the, the time scales of spontaneous adhesion by layering my cultured fat muscle tissue with cultured fat tissue. I then looked, uh, took images of them over time and compared them before and after heavy mixing or nutating. I could then quantify the surface area of each image or where the scaffolds are and then compare the changes in surface area. So presumably if these are falling apart, we'd see an increase in surface area. I can use that data to calculate an adhesion index. So the higher the adhesion index, the more these structures are sticking together. And what I found when I cultured mouse skeletal muscle cells on gelatin nanofibers that were layered with uh, mouse fat on gelatin microbeads is that they were sticking together at about the six hour time point. But I wanted to see if this translated across different scaffold types and cell types. So we worked with Matrix FT to obtain plant-based scaffolds. So imaged here, we have skeletal muscle on Xean uh, nanofibers that are layered with fat cells cultured on soy microbeads. And then I looked at primary rabbit cells and mouse cell lines. 
And I found for both cell types that adhesion was occurring around the six to 12 hour time point. In contrast, when no cells were present and I only layered the scaffolds, the structures would fall apart even at the 18 hour time point. So although we don't know the exact mechanism of adhesion, we can assume that it is cell-mediated, whether it's cell-cell or cell-matrix interactions. So what does this look like up close? Uh, this is a confocal image of rabbit skeletal muscle cells on aligned gelatin nanofibers. You could see that those in red. Um, layered with rabbit adipocytes that were cultured on gelatin microbeads, you can see that in the cyan in yellow. And what we found is that not only are they spontaneously adhering to one another, they actually appear to be integrating with one another on the time scale of hours to form what possibly might be the world's first rabbit marbled meat. Another benefit of this approach is you can tune the size of each tissue layer. So here is a cross section of my cultured meat um, versus Wagyu beef. And um, although there is of lots of area to improve the thickness of our muscle tissue layers, we were happy that we were able to successfully replicate the length scales of adipose tissue. We then wanted to calculate the mechanical properties of multi-component tissue. So we used a rheometer and we calculated a Young's modulus, or the stiffness of the tissue. We were also interested to see how post-processing steps um, after harvest could affect the mechanical properties of cultured meat. So we measured samples that were taken directly from culture media versus samples that were allowed to age overnight for 24 hours. And we found that in that short time point, we were able to increase the stiffness of the tissue by an order of magnitude. Um, however, it was still an order of magnitude softer than the Wagyu beef. So optimistically, we could say that our meat is more tender. Um, but realistically, well, there probably is some optimization needed there. We were also interested in the tensile properties. Um, so what are the mechanical properties when you pull apart the cultured meat? And we were also wanted to see how the nanoscopic properties could affect the tensile properties of cultured meat. So we made multi-component tissue with unaligned fibers versus aligned fibers. And then we took measurements along the grain and across the grain. And we compared that. And while we had a lot of variability in our data, we didn't see any statistical differences on the nanoscopic properties of the fibers used versus the tensile properties of the cultured meat. And again, you know, likely due to the variability, we didn't see any difference with the Wagyu beef. Um, but it's important to note that this data was a lot more consistent. And so this kind of shows an area improvement of how we can make uh, consistent cultured meat products. We wanted to look at the raw protein content as well, and what we found is that between rabbit and mouse cells, there was no statistical difference in the protein content. However, Wagyu trended to have a higher amount of protein content. And then we cooked, so this is what it looks in, like in real life, um, and we looked at cooking loss, and again, we didn't see any statistical difference in cooking loss properties across the three samples. So how do you build marble culture meat? To summarize, we layer micro tissues with different cell types to form larger cohesive tissue on the time scale of hours without the use of additional crosslinkers. And then we can tune the layers to desirable tissue length scales and finally optimize mechanical, nutritional, and cooking properties. I'd like to thank um, all of our funders. Thanks so much to GFI for your support and for having me. All of our collaborators and everyone in the Rowat Lab. As I was putting this slide together, I'm highlighting here that the cultured meat side of the lab is slowly but surely starting to take over. Um, and speaking of which, we have a postdoc position available. So if you're interested, please scan, or if you know someone that might be interested, um, yeah, feel free to visit the link. Thanks so much. All right, so we have some time for questions, and it just I know, I guess online, the slides are a little blurry, so if we can get that fixed, um, that would be great. And um, please submit your questions through the, the app um, during the talk, but we can start first with a question um, for Mark. So first of all, there was a question around just what's the timeline for publishing some of the results people were interested in understanding? Has that been published, or is that still in the works? So, so we're working on, on, on a publication at this point in time uh, together with uh, Umami Meats. Um, so maybe in the next six months or so, we'll probably publish something on the cell line. Sorry, yeah. So, so it, um, 
Yeah, it, it would be probably in the next six months or so. Um, we're working on a publication right now on the cell line development with, with Umami Meats. Great, and I think also just sort of on the lines, so do, do you think longer term that we can avoid the use of certain recombinant proteins like albumin and tran transferrin proteins that are typically used in really high amounts in cell culture? Do you imagine or envision that that is the direction that this industry will ultimately head on based on some of the experimental data that you've, you're getting from your lab, or, or will there always be a need for some of those recombinant forms? Well, my personal belief is that at least for albumin and transferrin, uh, to, to some extent for transferrin as well, we would probably be able to find um, some alternatives, uh, maybe from a plant source or some from other sources. But for growth factors, I think that would be quite tough. Um, I think at a minimum, uh, we, we would still have to, to rely, uh, you know, at least in the near future on, 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 a, uh, on a recombinant growth factor for, for large-scale production. Great, thank you. Uh, Tatsuya, the next uh, question's for you. So, um, you know, my understanding is there, there's some limitations to some of the scale up of algae in photobioreactors. And you showed on your last slide this, you know, envisioning this future where, you know, if we, if we build these circular cell culture systems, we can really capitalize on the land use advantages of, of cultivated meat technology. So I'm curious, what, what are those limitations that you're envisioning encountering when you're talking about scaling up the circular cell culture system and how might your collaboration with Integriculture uh, help with assisting that? Okay, so of course uh, you pointed out, so there are many, many problems for the scale up of the algae culture and of course animal cell culture. So regarding animal cell culture, we have collaborated with an uh, integral culture company. So this is a Japanese uh, first uh, cultivated meat uh, venture company. So they, uh, they, their concept is using the uh, supernatant uh, after culturing the cells. So they combined several types of cells. So they imitating in the body. So maybe liver and some, some types of cells sometimes. So they uh, circulate the culture media so they can get uh, e uh, enough growth factor. So we apply this technology, but also it's very now uh, it takes a high cost. So that now they have started to the, uh, scale up the about a hundred liter scale for getting a growth factor. So I hope, I believe that they will uh, minimize the cost. So if we can use such a uh, low cost growth factor and combine the algae extract, maybe we can uh, make the very low cost uh, culture media, I hope. So, but the, there are many, many problems, as you know. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and Stephanie, this, this question's for you. Um, so have you thought about or tested the use of fiberglass to tune some of the textural properties or the mechanical properties that you showed in your um, prototypes? I haven't yet. It was definitely an idea of mine. So the, the data I shared today kind of wrapped up the paper um, that I just published, and it was kind of the beginning of the next questions that we're asking is how do we really tune the mechanical properties uh, post-culture? And so I'd love to explore yeah, different ideas, but that's a great one. Great. And, and have you experimented at all with the length of differentiation for some of those mechanical properties? I guess, the, you know, theoretically, the differentiation should really affect maybe the nutritional and textural properties of the product. How, how far have you sort of went to experiment with that? Right. So in this paper, I use standard protocols for differentiation, but actually the next project that I'm working on, I'm looking to see how mechanical properties can actually accelerate that process. And so with uh, fat cells, for example, I'm finding that there are certain mechanical environments that I'm seeing a lot more substantial lipid accumulation within three days versus the typical you know, weeks that it takes for adipocytes to accumulate lipids. And so I'm exploring that more, and I hope that can be published one day. Great. And um, Tatsuya, just another question for you. Um, you showed some evidence that you can grow cells in sort of two rounds of this cell, circular cell culture system. Um, do you have a sense of, is there an upper limit to the number of times that you can cycle this process? Um, have, you, have you been testing that in your lab? Yeah, good question. So uh, I'm just trying to the more uh, cycle. But before uh, performing the such a third, fourth cycle, we 
have noticed some, uh, some factor is limited and uh, uh, positive and negative factor. So we now analyze the detail of the sum factor. And after that, we can start to the more uh, cycle. So and uh, first we now selected the algae. So we also, uh, little secret, <laughs> we uh, make the some gene modified algae. So such a uh, algae can use uh, lactate. So maybe we can clear one problem. So uh, and uh, are, are there are some remaining problem. After clearing this problem, I want to perform a more cycle. I see. Yeah. Great, and uh, I think we have what, one minute left. Okay, so I think I'd love to hear just Mark and Stephanie just briefly. Mark, your collaboration with Umami Bioworks. How do how do you envision? How is that helping your your lab and you thinking about your research? And likewise to you, Stephanie, you showed some collaborations with other academic groups and companies. Um, yeah, how does that help? It sort of drive some of the research questions forward that you're trying to to answer. Yeah. So so in uh, maybe if I could answer that first. Yeah. Sure. So so in NYP, you know, we are we work very closely with the industry and um, what it, our research is 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 mainly focused on trying to help. Um, industry solve their problems. So um, at this point in time, well, the story of Umami is that we started with some cell line work early on and now we've gone to the media. And um, for a company like Umami, I think uh, while, while they are very strong in certain areas, um, they may lack things like chemistry support, analytical chemistry support. And in our school, um, we are quite strong with the analytical chemistry support. So I think at this point in time, that's where uh, we see, you know, we're collaborating quite closely on, on, on the analytical chemistry, the spend media analysis, as well as, um, you know, the um, serum-free media development part of things. Yeah, so it's, it's a two. So we work hand in hand with them um, to try to help solve problems together. Stephanie, in 30 seconds or so. Sure, yeah, quickly, I, I think we've we've had less success collaborating with companies um, more closely. I feel like it's been hard to identify where the common ground is, and we have different goals in terms of research output, publications versus not publications. But I, what worked for us more recently with Matrix FT, for example, is uh, obtaining samples and allow the companies can then allow us to do unbiased studies on their products and then we can publish on that. And if the, of course, if the findings are positive, then it's kind of a win-win for both of us. And I feel like that model has been working really well for us. Excellent, thank you. You can hand the mic. All right, thank you everyone. Um, we do, before you sit down, we have some little speaker gifts for everyone. Um, thank you. All right. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Palmer Yu from Wildtype. Welcome, Palmer. Good morning. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak about uh, a few of the many uh, advances uh, we made in the cultivated seafood uh, space. Uh, I'm Palmer. I've been working with Wildtype for a little bit over four and a half years. Um, so the main message I would like to convey today is uh, we cannot do this alone. We really need partnership to reach the impact we hope we can reach with this industry. Uh, so one example of that um, within any company like Wildtype is the uh, partnership across multiple scientific teams to make one product together. Um, demonstrated here is um, basically our process going from uh, taking biopsy from the animal to making food. Uh, I'm more familiar with the part that's happening on the top part and we definitely experienced a lot of, um, in the old days we call them ex accidental threats or challenges. And um, going from how do we even get adherent cell lines established without contamination with cells actually keep proliferating to uh, growing them in some kind of suspension format. And then um, clean meat can only be so clean starting from the material. And if we have to use animal components to grow clean meat, then that kind of defeats the purpose. So um, I'm happy to say like, yeah, we don't need animal inputs anymore in our cell culture for at least salmon. Um, but that's not it. Like this is only coming from the cell side. We still need help with other talented scientists within or outside of the company for tissue engineering, process engineering, scaling up, full science, product development to even get to the last stage of having some food on the table. And 
we couldn't do this alone. We really need partnership. And from the early days, we have been inspired by the publications coming from Most Meat, from Paul's work in driving media costs down for stem cell media, as well as uh, more recent work from Believer Meats. And one key uh, challenge that we all face is how do we drive the cost down while not compromising on the output or even improving the output to still have high quality products? And the chart on the top is showing you guys in the past about three years a quarterly results of wild type driving down the cost or the unit cost of media while still steadily improving the output from that same unit of media. Uh, in this time span, um, scientists within wild type were able to drive the media cost down by 80% while um, achieving a 20-fold increase uh, in actual output. And it's for fun and giggles, um, you, we can look at the, uh, the chart at the bottom. Uh, these are actually real cultures in bioreactors that we had. The blue one is um, just at, at the beginning of the, of the top chart about three years ago, when we were still using serum in our culture, and the media can only support this kind of growth. And then the red line is a more recent run with animal component-free culture. And you can just see the density range is dramatically different. And that's how we were able to achieve a much, much higher output more recently. We couldn't do this alone. We need a partnership. And from the very early days, even establishing cell lines, we were taking advantage of the publications that's already there from academia in the 1960s. We were very lucky when we selected Salmon because there were those papers existent. Um, and we took full advantage of that, of temperature, of buffer systems, of even the starting media. There were papers like salmon, uh, for salmon in that space. And then more recently, um, we did RNA-seq analysis. That was actually led by a talented scientist, Diana, actually sitting in the audience, uh, to, to look at this question about how do we drive serum to zero? Um, and we compare RNA-seq results coming from culture that is with higher serum versus culture that's with lower serum and compare the difference. Volcano plot might be a little bit too technical, but overall we're looking at the difference in gene expression from these two different culture systems and trying to look for guides on which pathway should we target. We were only able to do this because of the help from the University of Victoria, even though we're not directly collaborating, but this university published the whole genome sequence result for coho salmon, as well as actually whole genome annotation for it. We would love to do the same of analysis for some other amazing seafood species like bluefin tuna, spot prawn, or other, other seafood. And we have the cell lines established, but we actually today couldn't do the same RNA-seq analysis for those kind of um, species or cell lines because as you can see on the table on the right, or to the right, right? Yeah, <laughs> to the right. Uh, that for bluefin tuna, at least there is sequencing result, but annotation is much less uh, polished. And then for species in the crustaceans field, these are really amazing animals, but we really know very little about them. Um, so we would love to partner with academia and then provide materials like what Stephanie actually talked about and then maybe publish results together. We couldn't do this alone. Um, even for the cultivated meat industry to succeed, we still need to partner with other industries. Um, again, like clean meat can only be so clean from the input. We do need advancement from renewable energy, from recycling water. It's funny, like a lot of people feel like water is cheap. No, it's not. Water is definitely not cheap, not free. And, and for cultivated meat, if if suspension culture is the way to go, then we're going to use the volume. The volume comes from water, and water needs to be clean. Um, and then scale up, engineering support, as well as um, media input. That's, I think, uh, multiple speakers already touched base on, is how do we replace all these more expensive components in media with cheaper, even larger scale components? And in addition to the scientific advancements um, we have been able to do, um, there are, we, we have to remember there are people working hard day in and day out to defend our environment every day. And 
at Wild Type, we feel very proud that we played a very small part of it in helping to secure this amazing space in Alaska called Bristol Bay. And that was the, the home of the largest fishery for sockeye salmon. And so overall, this is the message. Um, the work I talked, touched base on very briefly are collaborations within wild type, outside of wild type, amazing scientists, dedicated scientists working together. We won't be able to do this alone. Please join us. Um, and only by having this partnership, we can achieve something even greater. Thank you. Thanks so much, Palmer. Next, we're excited to welcome Sophie Hubilek from Mosami. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's really nice to meet you. My name is Sophie Hubalek. I'm really excited to be able to speak today on behalf of Mozamid. Um, I'll quickly jump over the disclosures. Uh, I'm a scientist. I've been with Mozamid for almost five years. And yeah, since I work uh, in the lab, my, my relationship is obviously employment. Um, at Mozamid, we focus on producing cultivated beef burgers from bovine muscle tissue. So for this, we take the cells from one of our living cows by taking a biopsy, and then we we take uh, muscle cells and uh, fat cells that we pro uh, proceedingly cultivate, proliferate, and uh, then mature to uh, mature to muscle and fat tissue. You can see here on the left side when you compare in vivo uh, matured uh, tissue that we can actually mimic mimic the maturation quite closely. So while we're doing well on, say, the biology side of things, and while we're doing well uh, in reaching uh, the goals in terms of the differentiation quality, what we're still struggling with, and I think we've also heard it previously in the previous talks of this, uh, this panel, is that we're dealing still with high costs for media compounds. Oh, oh, okay, but then I cannot use the pointer? Huh? Maybe I can. Ah, okay, okay. So, um, I think we've previously uh, also mentioned that we are still dealing with really high costs for the media compounds. Um, this is because we're using pharma-grade compounds. Pharma-grade compounds are highly purified. They undergo uh, several quality... Uh, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> they, they undergo qu uh, several quality uh, checks. And, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> okay, again, okay, so our problem is that um, we are dealing with really high costs uh, for the media compounds, that's because we're using pharma grade compounds, and as uh, we, I'm so sorry, <laughs> okay, um, can I start again? Okay, okay, okay. <sighs> I'm going to start again. I'm really sorry. I'm really nervous, as you can see. Um, all right. I wanted to start the slide by saying we're doing well on the biology side of things. And what we're doing well on the biology side of things, um, the main challenge we have yet to master is how we can economize the production process. And the production process is mainly expensive for the reasons that the media formulation is still very expensive. And that is because the cost of the media compounds are high as they're pharma grade, they're highly purified, and um, they, they, they're they highly purified and they lead us, uh, they, they, wow, I'm so stuck on this one. Maybe I'm just going to skip this one and talk about, <laughs> wow, and talk about just this example because I put in this funny example of how much it would cost to uh, bake 15 cookies from pharma grade compounds and maybe some of you have seen that example and baking 15 cookies using pharma grade compounds is actually worth $30,000. And I mean, that describes pretty well our situation with uh, the media compound costs. So we cannot really work on this by ourselves. We cannot really bring down these costs uh, ourselves. We are relying, and as we've heard before, on collaborators that provide us with cheap growth factors, cheap albumins, and so on. But what we can work on is the feed conversion. And the feed conversion is defined by x kilogram um, nutrients that are translated in x kilogram biomass. And we also need to 
to economize that feed conversion because we also experience quite some losses when economizing this. Why do we have losses? We have losses of valuable compounds because of the reasons of metabolic waste accumulation. Cells produce uh, metabolic waste such as ammonia and as it reaches critical values, we need to exchange the medium prematurely. So that's a limitation. This is why we also need to implement recycling strategies in order to recover valuable compounds and be able to reintroduce them back into the process. I've also mentioned losses for the, for the reasons. Another uh, reason for uh, losses is, for example, that um, basal, off-shelf basal media formulations are not tailored towards the specific cell needs. So also here we need to apply minimum feeding strategies to decrease that loss and Regarding the waste ma ma management, we've heard something uh, uh, about algae being able to remove ammonia, for example, but we also need to figure out um, technologies that can remove the ammonia or actually suppress it. So these are the considerations. Um, regarding costs, we have one quite uh, important collaboration with Nutreco. Maybe you've heard them before. They're also a sponsor uh, on this conference. And uh, Nutrico is a Dutch feedstuff um, producer. And within the project Feed for Meat, which was funded by the EU, we are um, collaborating and exploring the application of food grade alternatives to be replaced in our media formulation. So Nutrico helps us with providing us uh, amino acids, um, peptides, hydrolysates to test on our cells. And we can see that not only do we have a huge improvement when it comes to price, so on this graph you see the price of uh, food uh, and pharma grade glucose, that difference, but also do we see that we actually have a really good cell performance when using food grade compounds. I mentioned the metabolic waste part uh, uh, in the slide before, and I'm going to show you some snippets on, the, on research that we're doing on that end. And I first want to mention Traditionally, in cell culture, culture medium is supplemented with glutamine. Glutamine is thought to be essential for the cells. That's why we feed it. The downside of glutamine is that it is metabolized into ammonia. If ammonia reaches uh, critical levels, it can become toxic. So what we tried here was, for that research, we tried to replace glutamax. Before, we first looked into, okay, how much, how much glutamax are they taking up? How much ammonia are they producing? And on the left graph, you can see um, four uh, isolations that were uh, cultured, or fat cells that were cultured in a steered environment or microcarriers. Um, and we can see that the ammonia production is going up and is mirroring quite well the glutamax uptake. And um, you can also see that the curves are really zigzagged and really un unnice to look at, and that is because each point is showing a before and after medium exchange concentration uh, measurement. And why is that relevant? If we think about, okay, how can I keep my ammonia below a certain threshold, and in this case we decided we want to keep it below one and a half millimolar, that was before we knew that our critical level is actually at five millimolar, um, holding it b b below one and a half millimolar led us to needing to exchange the medium quite a lot. And that is what I was mentioning earlier with also excessive medium exchanges that are really depending on the metabolic waste accumulation. So from there we proceeded to develop a glutamax-free medium. Um, we were testing a couple of compounds that we found in literature from actually from the 90s. Um, and here you can see a lower graph, glutamax, as a control. And then we tested three compounds, namely alpha ketoglutarate, pyruvate. Yeah, I know, I, I might need a minute longer. Sorry, it's my, uh, not, not my day. <laughs> um, um, we're testing glutamax versus uh, the replacements that are namely alpha ketoglutarate, pyruvate, uh, glutamate, these are uh, compounds that um, participate in energy metabolism in the TCA cycle or uh, glycolysis. And um, you can see that the doubling times are um, not statistically significant, sig significantly different to the control, albeit we can see a little bit of a, uh, yeah, a trend. Um, and this short-term proliferation assay was done on microcarriers, and what is actually relevant 
is not only did we not have a, a significant difference in terms of doubling times, but what was relevant is that for the control, the glutamax control, we saw ammonia accumulating, while for the replacements in that short-term assay, we didn't have any ammonia accumulation. So this is why you see that the rates are actually negative, which, act which, which actually indicates that in the basal formulation, the, the low amounts of ammonia that are already in the basal um, um, formulation, that ammonia is actually being taken up. So we're investigating this. From there, we proceeded to also look into long-term adaptation of glutamax replacements. So we adapted the cells over several passages in glutamax-free proliferation medium and subsequently differentiated them in glutamax-free differentiation medium. And here we can see uh, less of a trend, more of a comparable adaptation in terms of doubling times between the control and the glutamax replacements. And now what is the most relevant? This graph, it means lipid volume per cell. So looking at the differentiation quality of the adipocytes, we could surprisingly see that removing glutamax and glutamine from the proliferation and differentiation media would lead to an improved differentiation thereafter. So these were really nice results. We also looked into the ammonia, ammonia accumulation um, in the differentiation medium and we couldn't see any ammonia being uh, produced. So now we are able to get entirely rid of ammonia, which means we can increase the medium lifespan and apply more uh, sophisticated feeding strategies without needing to worry about replenishing. These uh, results are published uh, lately. Um, yeah, okay, then. Then I'm just going to say thank you at this point. Thank you for listening and uh, thank you for inviting. All right, so we have a, a few minutes for, for questions. Um, and there's a question, um, I guess, for, for both of you that you might be able to respond to, which is how influential are non-affiliated open access university research findings on industrial cultivated meat endeavors. So essentially, what are you doing to try to maybe incentivize projects um, and increase some of the support for, for more open access research um, that will be published by some of the academics in the room? I guess the first part is greatly, and as I have spoken to, that uh, we really, at uh, Wild Type, um, we're, we're fortunate that those publications already exist uh, when we first started uh, studying coho salmon. That there were uh, lines that's already derived uh, with protocols published about how to derive coho salmon lines or Pacific salmon lines. They, they might be looking at sockeye or some others. But those were like translatable. And then though it, like despite all the other challenges we have, we're facing that um, like not very well annotated genome, like and uh, antibodies not working for these kind of um, species. But those papers were so helpful. Um, and then, then later on, when we were trying to do more sophisticated uh, analysis, that having finding out there is an annotated genome out there for coho salmon was really, really helpful. Um, the second part of the question is, how do we facilitate that? I, I guess maybe just keep broadcasting this message that we look forward to collaborating. We look forward to especially publishing fundamental uh, science or fundamental knowledge. Um, yeah. Sophie, do you have thoughts on Yeah, that? Yeah, uh, yeah it's, a, it's, it's a great question. I was actually also wanting to address this during the presentation. Um, yeah, I think Mozamit, for example, was born on public funding. We're still receiving public funding for that Feed for Meat project, for example, that was, that was funded by the EU. We rely on that. Um, Mark Post is hosting a yearly scientific cultured, uh, uh, international scientific conference on cultured meat that is purely there to share knowledge and purely there to share new uh, scientific advances. So I think for us, our stand is that without sharing that knowledge and without helping to facilitate each other each other's progress in that industry, we're actually blocking each other and we need to do that in order to reach that common goal, which is, you know, saving the environment. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. Hey, there's, a, there's another question for you, Sophie, which I mean, you showed, I think, reducing ammonia production in general could be a really major advance in terms of accelerating you know, the bioprocess, increasing yields, et cetera. Um, but the question is, so is it costly to replace the glutamine with these other 
uh, ingredients, pyruvate, alpha ketoglutarate, are those produced at any sort of scale right now that enables them to be used at low cost? Um, it reminds me of the question you posted on LinkedIn. It was exactly the same question, and I have prepared the answer for that. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I have I have all the numbers. So um, yeah, so say alpha ketoglutarate is five times more expensive than uh, glutamine glutamax at the moment. It still only contributes to say one percent of the media formulation. So that would go from one to maybe five percent of the media formulation. That doesn't really change. The, 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 the ratio that it contributes albumin and uh, uh, insulin. So these compounds usually contribute with like 30 to 40 percent. So if we can get uh, 10 times less medium exchanges because we don't have any ammonia and we can do f you know fat increased fat batch feeding, that is still much much cheaper than the four percent increase of the of the um, yeah of the cost of that replacement compound. Great, yeah. Great. thank you. Yeah, and. Palmer, uh, last question for you. So, I, I mean, you showed some interesting data with this inverse relationship between cost and yield that you've been able to generate at, at wild type. So I, people, I think, are curious in general at which, what type of scale you're operating at. And I mean, with this sort of decrease in media costs and this increase in yield, are you at a point now where the techno-economics are starting to make sense, or do you need to drive down those costs further and increase those yields significantly further, uh, maybe even at upscale? Like, what, what sorts of, um, you know, drivers with respect to the techno-economics are, where are you at in that? Right, uh, so sense? second part of it, uh, we definitely look forward to the next 20 fold, for sure. And we are definitely looking for the next 80% reduction, for sure. Uh, but I'm happy to say that, uh, first of all, the, the results I showed are at bench scale biorectors. Um, the, the, the data points are from that. Um, and uh, we do see similar yields, and the media input is, is the same uh, at larger scale, it's stainless steel and then larger. Uh, but there is a delta, and we have a talented team working to reduce that delta. Um, but the, the, the yield is not the same at, at larger scale. Uh, what was the first part, sorry? I think it, as you got to what I was asking, which is just say, how much further do you need to go essentially? All right, uh, yeah. so yeah, I'm happy to say though, like even today with our cost model, um, media input cost is no longer the biggest component for our product cost, <laughs> labor is. Uh, and so, so we already got to this far. And, uh, and I just, if I can say a little bit more about this is, at least going into this industry, a lot of us scientists had the same doubt or skepticism about how are we ever going to make it cheap enough. Um, and, and there's the published news or articles about oh, if the pharmaceutical companies couldn't do it, why would the cultivated meat industry be able to do it? And after working in this industry for a few years, my input to that, not a direct response, is uh, the pharmaceutical companies never faced the same pressure we did. Pharmaceutical companies are able to work with a much fatter profit margin. Uh, and, and just from speaking from personal experience, you have no idea how motivating it is when a CEO tells a group of talented scientists it's not good enough and do it better. And that's personal experience and something better comes out. Uh, maybe not at the original timeline, but at least one or two quarters later, we actually hit the mark. All right, thank you. Let's thank Palmer and Sophie and welcome up uh, Paul to the stage. Let's welcome Paul Burridge from Clever Carnivore. So I, um, I guess I knew that uh, my, my thunder would be stolen and we'd had a few talks on um, some of the things that have been worked on in the cultivated meat field. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an aligned field. You know, obviously, particularly in the U.S., we've had a lot of money spent on biology research, but of course, it's nothing in comparison to the amount that's been spent in medicine. And I want to try and talk to you today about, you know, we've, we've seen examples of moving from having FBS in the media to maybe albumin and... and um, chemically defined formulas and other developments that can be done. And for many companies and for many of us in this field, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was an example to follow um, that had been done on this subject? So I'm gonna to talk to you 
um, maybe um, a little bit about human-induced pluripotent stem cells. So whatever cell type you're thinking of, you think has had a lot of money spent on it, maybe um, Cho cells or uh, 293T cells or something, there is no cell type that has had the type of money spent on it like human-induced pluripotent stem cells or human pluripotent stem cells as they used to be. So back in the dawn of time in 1998, uh, human embryonic stem cells were invented or discovered and they were just grown in a regular media, uh, DMEM in FBS. And we went through this progression over time of eliminating the FBS, um, eliminating these to be grown on a, on a feeder layer of mouse cells, um, slowly starting to establish the growth factors that can enable these cells growth um, without these feeders, without the FBS, without this serum replacer that used to be used. Um, getting through to protocols now where we have media formula that are completely chemically defined, so no albumin, no FBS, um, no animal-based proteins within them. And what I want to tell you is there were hundreds of labs involved in this process. Um, I have a full version of this schematic, so 43 major publications to take us from FBS all the way through to a fully chemically defined media um, and about 25 years of research. Of course, everything now is much, much faster, um, but this is an example. So if you, if you want to go through your history, like there are, there is existing knowledge of how to do this. We don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, so one of the things um, that my own lab has worked on actually, um, so going back a step. So when the first chemically defined media was made, to my frustration, I saw that paper come out and I had all of the components to hand to make it. And I had been working on this for a long time. Um, I made it on the first day that was published. So I could have done it if only I had known. So we have since been working on these media formula, um, how to make um, not only the, the media as chemically defined and as simple as possible, but also how do you make it as cheap as possible. Now one of the saddest things in academic science is when a lab publishes a protocol and they say we have figured all of this out and then they license it to a company and they sell it for $500 a litre. That is, as you can see, a very common phenomenon. Um, so this is the company that didn't develop the media. All they did is make it and, and now they're selling it. And it, essentially, you know, this is taxpayers' funds that's going um, straight to profit. So when we, we were making our own media in-house um, with commercial growth factors and essentially trying to make it as, you know, we're an academic lab and we were trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, so we had got this cost down to about $115 a litre. Um, so what I'm going to tell you is, um, even with an academic environment that has no real genuine push towards cost efficiency, you know, my academic lab was working at the scale where um, we were using hundreds of litres of media a, a month. And um, we, have de we developed this new media formulation um, where we got it down to about $16, which at the time, I'm, you know, I'm talking about a formula from... Uh, five years ago, um, that was considered a great success. But I think all of us can agree, and especially from what you've um, heard this morning, cultivated meat needs to have the media be incredibly cost effective. Um, we think realistically it needs to be down below 10 cents a liter um, for a, a production facility. Um, as we heard, even the water at that kind of, you know, the right grade of water in those kind of volumes could be problematic. So. As I have alluded to, um, maybe we'll just stick to this slide. Uh, okay, so um, I, I mentioned the cost we were at. So this is with, actually I, I re-looked up the prices, so we published this paper, and right now um, this is the kind of cost um, that to an academic lab actually seems very cost effective, but obviously is, is pretty poor. So this is making a media formulation, purely buying all of the reagents. And of course, that is where the limitation comes. So um, pre-COVID, so this was, I think this was online in mid 2019. So it means this is, 
you know, probably six or seven years out of date now. Um, we did develop this formula, and we quite bravely called it a negligible cost chemically defined media. So within this process, you can see um, exactly what it takes, um, not only to formulate a media, but also to go through the academic process of publishing a paper, which is a miserable process. And um, so, I mean, this, this paper was a year in revision, even though it's quite a trivial piece of work. Um, <laughs> That's just how the publication process is. Um, and as you can see, lots and lots of optimization, lots of looking at individual components. We were very focused on the, the proteins within the media. Um, and like I say, we uh, one of the very simple but very important findings of this paper, we could correlate proliferation with pluripotency, that is maintenance of the stem cell state. So essentially that means you can use proliferation as a readout of is your media a good formula. Um, we have since published another paper, again, in this same very slow to publish journal. And um, this is where we've completely dismantled the entire media, every single amino acid, vitamin, salt, every component, prove that it's necessary, prove what its optimal concentration is, and prove when you change these things exactly what happens to the cells. Um, we found this absolutely fascinating in a much simpler media, as you've just heard, you know, Palmer stole my thunder, a much simpler media, the cells, they, they like it even more. It's very specific. Um, our cells are completely glycolytic. They are unable to use the TCA cycle in this formula. Um, so it, it's fascinating that you can get more and more very closely defined, a very a cheaper media, um, and the, cell, the cells are, are working even better. So I'm trying to tell you there are many, many publications out there, including some of ours, that will really uh, help uh, inform development of media. And um, at our company, at Clever Carnivore, of course, this is the basis of the type of technology we use and the type of methodology that we use for media development. Um, so yes, this is us. And um, I guess I'll hand it on to questions at the end. Thank you so much, Paul. Our final speaker, unfortunately, isn't able to join us in person, um, but he did record a video, and he'll be joining us for the Q&A. Um, so if we could get Kobe's video up, our next speaker will be Yaakov Nakmias from Believer Meets. Hey, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today to speak with you about cultivated meat. Meat is a very interesting thing. Uh, we all respond to it. And looking at the steak, many of us are actually have an emotional response. We can either smell it, or some of us can even taste it. A lot of us are smiling at this steak. What we're responding to is the adipose tissue. You see the white pieces between the muscle fibers, when we grill them, produce hundreds of polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which are very difficult to produce synthetically. And we, as human beings, have become very, very sensitive to we can smell them, sense them from more than 500 yards away. And the biggest question we have today in the field is how do we get the same emotional response? How do we get the same physical response to the grilling of meat as you saw in a second from that image? How do we replicate this? And the seed to that answer was actually seeded more than a decade ago by Mark Post and others, suggesting that cultivated meat could be the solution. We can grow fat cells. We can take stem cells, which are unstable, but grow them on microcarriers in a way that allows them to make enough of them to use them to make three-dimensional tissues, whether cell sheets or aggregates, that we can then eat. The problem with this method is that stem cells require a lot of growth factors to grow, so they're very expensive.